All right. So we should be seeing people trickle in. All right, so so everybody who is just joining, um, we are going to start in just a minute. I think I'm going to wait just maybe a minute or two longer. Um, so the way this works is that uh, if you have questions, um, you can click on the little Q&A button on the bottom of your screen, and um, you can type a question in the box. All right, so I think we'll get going. So hi, everybody. My name's Julia. I am the Assistant Executive Director of the Maine Film Center. Um, I'm here with David Abel, um, who is the director of Entangled, and hopefully you've all seen Entangled on Vimeo. Um, so this is a film about the endangered North Atlantic right whale and the impact on, of the lobster industry, as well as the impact on conservation efforts on the livelihood of lobstermen. Um, and then climate change is obviously heightening everything. <laughs> um, so, so it's a film with a lot of tensions and interesting characters. Um, and so this film, Entangled, is also a finalist for the Jackson Wild 2020 Media Awards, which is, if you don't know, it's kind of like the Oscars of nature film. That's what they call it. Um, and am I right? Is the, is the winner being announced tomorrow? Is that right? That's correct. Yes. All right. Well, we will be rooting for you <laughs> for sure. Uh, thank you very much. I, I actually uh, will very privately announce here that we won. So, hey! uh, <laughs> oh my but gosh, don't but don't spread nope, the word. <laughs> we're, we're not going to spread. Nobody, nobody spread the word. Uh, we'll, we'll pop the champagne later. <laughs> <laughs> or the vital water. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay. Wow. That's great. Um, so, so Lobster War, which is your, your previous film, it was a huge hit here at Red Road, Red Road Square. Um, and I'm sure a lot of folks were eager to watch your next film. Um, so just to, just to start off, just one question to start you off. Um, how did the idea for this particular story originate um, and how did it kind of develop throughout the production process? So, um, so that's a good segue to what you were just saying. So this film in a lot of ways is an outgrowth of my last film um, uh, lobster war. And I, I kind of like to think of this as the capstone of our trilogy of films, uh, on fisheries issues, um, in New England. Previous to Lobster War, we made a film called Sacred Cod, uh, which premiered at the Camden Film Festival. And, um, and that film, uh, all, all three of the films have a lot of similarities, um, uh, am I good? Can, are, are you following me okay? Connection okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, all three of those films were about how climate change has had a tangible impact on our lives and particularly here uh, in New England on the Gulf of Maine and all of those folks who are living, um, making their living from the Gulf of Maine. And um, Sacred Cod looked at um, how the warming uh, waters uh, caused a significant uh, decline in our iconic species, the cod, and, um, and how while overfishing has occurred for many years, uh, the fish were generally able to bounce back, but the warming had made it 
increasingly difficult for that to happen. Uh, and now the uh, cod population is about 90% uh, below uh, what its uh, historic levels were once were. Um, and uh, that led to looking at how climate change was affecting the lobster fishery. And all of this, I should say, is fueled through my daytime job as a reporter for the Boston Globe, where I work as um, a environmental reporter. And, uh, and I've covered these issues for a number of years. And uh, the, um, when I, I, I'd written a story about, um, about this brewing conflict between Canada and the United States over this area called the gray zone um, in, uh, in between the two countries that both countries had been disputing um, uh, the, uh, who, the ownership claims of this small island um, called the Machaya Seal Island. And as a result, they both claim the surrounding waters and nobody really cared about that for centuries until um, in, uh, in recent years, the waters uh, warmed to the point that they kind of reached a sweet spot for lobster. And while the lobster population had plummeted by some 90% uh, below Cape Cod uh, in areas of like Long Island Sound, um, putting nearly the entire lobster industry out of business in places like Connecticut and Long Island, New York, um, the lobster population started to boom in, um, in the waters off of down East Maine and in this area called the gray zone. And as a result, uh, as uh, anyone who's seen Lobster War knows, that's inspi inspired this, this uh, increasing conflict between fishermen on both sides of the watery divide. And while researching that film, I um, learned about all of uh, the issues that were coming up with North Atlantic right whales and how um, while the fishery, the lobster fishery was doing quite well here uh, um, in the Gulf of Maine and especially in Maine where the catch, lobster catch had exceeded 100 million pounds for years, um, uh, they suddenly were facing a new threat and that threat were, um, those threats involved the uh, possibility of new punitive regulations that could require a massive uh, decline in the number of uh, lines that they use for their traps and also potentially uh, closures to fishing um, to protect this species of whale uh, that number now for about 400 or fewer and there are only uh, about 100 or probably fewer at this point, breeding females. And as a result, um, um, uh, for a variety of reasons that we'll get into, I'm sure uh, they are increasingly threatened with extinction. It's a, yeah, it's definitely a, a sobering topic. Um, so one of the, one of the things about both Entangled and Lobster War that I found interesting was that, you know, there's this really, this, this big tension between conservationists and, you know, working fishermen. Um, I guess specifically for Entangled, did you find yourself kind of siding with either group? Um, you know, as a reporter, my, my hope and effort is to really try to try to portray the nuances of an issue and the and plumb the depths of it and try to make people from both sides sort of hopefully see um, other points of view um, with the with the with the understanding in this case with entangled um, and taking a step back to lobster war you know I was not taking a side between the US and Canada um, uh, even if some people might have thought that I was certainly had no agenda um, on that front. And I, I didn't come to this film with an agenda that, you know, we were trying to save the whales uh, or protect the, protect the fishery. My hope is that uh, people will walk away from this film understanding that um, there are, uh, that the, that this, that we're, let me actually say that 
what inspired this film in some ways was this report last year by the United Nations that found that a million species are at risk of extinction by the end of this century. And I, I found that, that number overwhelming and, and hard to fathom and thought, how do you tell a story about such a big number? And I thought maybe I can tell the story through one particular species. And, and that's uh, while I was learning a lot about all of the issues facing these whales. Um, and these whales are of course an iconic species here. They're on the license plate uh, in Massachusetts. Um, and um, and it's, a, it's easy to identify with these whales and, and appreciate uh, them. They're known as a charismatic species, uh, whatever the hell that means. Um, charismatic but, megafauna or whatever it's called. Yes, yes, that's it, that's <laughs> it, right, yes. Yep. <laughs> that drives me crazy when I hear that. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but ultimately, um, my hope was to look at you know, the efforts to protect this species while understanding how those efforts to protect them could, uh, could have uh, a se severe impact on, uh, on people whose livelihoods depend on the water. And we, you know, in Maine, you all know better than I do how important the lobster industry is. And I do not, uh, uh, think that, you know, we should be losing our, our lobster industry. Um, uh, uh, my hope is that, that any regulations are, uh, do the utmost to protect the whales at the same time, trying their best to protect the industry and keep both to thread that, uh, that needle as, you know, um, smartly as possible. All right, so we are getting some questions in. And um, for everybody who wants to submit a question, uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to type your question in. Um, so we've got a question from Helen. Uh, is it too late to save the right whales with only 10 new calves this year? What do we as humans do about that? Is the apparatus shown in the film a sonar device? Would would that eliminate the need for lines to buoys ready to go? And how long would it take to get that in service? Too expensive for the lobstermen. Um, so I guess she's talking about the, yeah, the, the device that's in development um, that you showed in the film of the sort of sending the signal down to the trap to bring it back up to the surface. Yeah. Um, so, I don't, I don't know if it's too late. Um, that's, that question is, is above my pay grade and nature has, you know, interesting ways of responding to all kinds of things. Um, so hopefully not, uh, but uh, a lot of the scientists suggests that, um, that they are approaching fundamental extinction and um, this, uh, um, uh, I'm just pulling open a document here. Um, um, the, I think it's the ICUN, um, the International Conservation Union. Uh, I might be getting their, that name uh, slightly off, uh, but they uh, found that right whales are considered critically endangered uh, just a few months ago. And that finding on their red, uh, uh, list of endangered species uh, puts them one category away from essentially extinct. So, um, so at 10 right whale calves, and we've already lost this year two of those calves. So we've really only had eight calves born. One of those calves that died uh, was killed hours after it was born uh, in the breeding grounds um, uh, off of the coast of Georgia and Northern Florida. And that was this tragedy. Um, and there was an effort to try to save the whale, uh, save the calf by, uh, uh, by shooting antibiotics 
into in, into its side and um, and but the calf has never been seen after that and uh, and it's believed to have died um, and we know another calf died off the coast of New York uh, earlier this year and so those are the only two known whales to die this year which is better than last year uh, when 10 whales died um, and uh, in 2017, we saw 17 right whales die, and those are the those are the known deaths. It, it's uh, believed to be that twice as many um, are um, die or um, as, as many die um, that are never found as those that are found. As far as the question about ropeless fishing, um, there, uh, you know, I think it depends who you talk to. It seems like. The technology has matured quite a bit in recent years, and um, that um, uh, and that has promised uh, that that has great promise. And so, hopefully, uh, we could be at a place if there's sufficient funding that some of this technology could be uh, more viable at a larger scale. But, uh, but a lot of fishermen just don't believe that. And the technology still has, is still in a formative state. So it's you know, yet to be seen whether it can really work at the scale that uh, the main lobster industry works at. Um, so this is kind of a broader question. Um, thanks to my sister Ellen in DC for <laughs> submitting this question. Um, she asks, uh, what is the best way for the average documentary viewer to make a real difference in mitigating climate change and its related effects? It's easy to feel helpless in, ma in many climate change related issues. Are there any steps we can take? Um, Ha, huh. uh, let me just uh, um, uh, correct something I just said. It's the International Union for Conservation of Nature uh, that found uh. that right whales uh, are critically endangered and on their red list of threatened species. Um, and just to be clear, the classification uh, that um, they're considered to be is uh, gone from the wild, which is essentially one step away from uh, extinction. Mm. Um, as far as what someone watching this could do, uh, you know, in terms of taking steps to uh, try to address climate change, um, I think the first thing is vote. Um, and last night we watched a presidential debate, if you could call it that, uh, whatever that, um, uh, I think Dana Bash from CNN used the technical term shit show. So, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, whatever you call it, there was a, a segment where climate change was discussed and you could very clearly gauge the difference between um, the two candidates. And uh, one considers climate change a hoax and the other considers it a very uh, significant issue that needs uh, serious plans to address. And obviously that uh, uh, the latter person is, is Joe Biden. And so um, voting for candidates um, either in Congress or uh, on the presidential level who are willing to take aggressive steps to address climate change um, is the first step I would say and then thinking about um, you know, how to live your life in a way that uh, is uh, as carbon neutral as possible uh, by reducing your emissions in wherever you can um, is also, I think, a simple step that you can, you can take. Um, but I, I, I sort of feel in that question a certain sense of helplessness, um, which I think, or powerlessness, um, I think, you know, anyone who, uh, I think we're all there in some way because the truth of the matter is we are, um, we're individuals and real effective action has to be collective. 
and it has to be done on large scales. And we are emitting so much carbon, or, or we have already emitted so much carbon into the atmosphere that we've already baked in uh, probably two degrees of two degrees Celsius of warming, which is going to have um, even more uh, catastrophic impacts than we've already seen so far. We've we've already warmed by about one degree, um, and we're in store uh, over the next uh, uh, several decades to increase that by another degree. Um, and we could even go up by four degrees if worst case scenarios suggest, if worst case scenarios come true and, and, and at the current trajectory, we're, we're heading toward worst case scenarios and uh, four degrees Celsius would be a, a world extraordinarily different from the one we're living in right now. Mm. Um, do you know if this is, uh, if right whale entanglement and endangerment and extinction is a topic, and maybe I should know this, but um, is a topic in the main Senate race uh, between Susan Collins and Sarah Gideon? Uh, I haven't followed uh, the different positions closely enough to say, you know, who, um, it, what the differences are in the positions, but I can say that um, the Democratic Party has clearly favored aggressive action um, and the Republican Party has, uh, has, has, does not and has taken lots of steps to try to discredit efforts to take action. Um, and we heard that last night in the debate. And, um, and, you know, there's a longstanding senator who has voted, you know, quite uh, frequently uh, with her party. Um, and so, um, and so I think, you know, if you're uh, a voter in Maine, you should look at um, not just the person you're voting for, but the, uh, the, the party that that person is connected to. And, um, and I think that says a lot about the, about the candidate. If you're, if you're looking at it through the prism of a, uh, of climate change. Mm. I, I was just thinking about the scene with um, Shelly Pingree and um, I thought it was interesting how she was saying, you know, these federal regulations are no good for Maine lobstermen um, when she herself is a Democrat and a pretty progressive Democrat. So, so did you explore any kind of like nuance in, in that kind of Maine a uh, politician or kind of mainer, I guess, just, you know, the people who are really trying to stick up for all mainers, including um, people who are making their living uh, in the fishing industry and people who are concerned about the environment. Yeah, so there's no question that uh, fisheries uh, issues inspire a kind of bipartisan loyalty to fishermen. Uh, so we see that here in Massachusetts as well. Um, and throughout New England, there, it, you know, it doesn't matter which uh, side of the political divide you're on. Uh, there are, fishermen are vocal. Uh, they tend to have uh, strong lobbying organizations and money behind them. And, uh, and they represent powerful industries. Uh, in our states, and um, and so there's a lot of political uh, support to try to help and protect those industries. Um, and so it it's interesting because uh, whether it's the governor, the, the the new Democratic governor of Maine, or uh, the congressman uh, in Maine, or even here our senators um, and representatives, they they straddle this very tricky divide uh, over how to, um, how to balance their environmental, their impulses to repair the environment. And in this case, uh, try to preserve um, declining biodiversity. And at the same time, protect uh, what a lot of fishermen see as an endangered industry. 
and um, and certainly the uh, proposed regulations to protect right whales that have been in the works now for more than a year uh, and have still yet to be released, presumably because of political influence um, uh, on a variety of levels. Uh, but those efforts to help to protect right whales could certainly have an economic impact uh, and potentially significant economic impact on a lot of the fishermen. So, um, so, you know, no politician wants to see, um, th wants to see their um, constituents in economic danger. Um, and so, um, so it's easier to represent their interests, let's say, than it is to represent the interests of whales who don't vote. <laughs> Not yet, maybe <laughs> soon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, all right. So another question from Ellen. Um, <laughs> thanks, Ellen. Uh, what is it like balancing your role as a journalist for the Boston Globe and also working on independent projects, like being a director for an important documentary like Entangled? Uh, thank you, Ellen, for that question. Um, so. Uh, you know, it, it, it requires, um, it requires working a, a lot more. That's, that's number one. Um, it, uh, it involves sometimes, uh, a tricky balance, um, uh, in terms of ensuring that I am, uh, working, uh, diligently for the paper and also making the best film I can. Uh, but, uh, on the flip side, most of these uh, films that I've made uh, overlap with my work at the paper. And so one informs the other. And so uh, the truth is that um, there's a certain seamlessness to it. And it's just, uh, this is a longer term project where a lot, of the, a lot of the reporting that I do for the paper, which in some ways is episodic, uh, feeds the larger narrative that has gone into some of these films. And uh, and helps you know uh, helps me learn and deepen my reporting and understanding to make these films really nuanced and thoughtful. Um, so um, so rather than there being a conflict, there's actually I think a a, a lot of complement complementary um, learning uh, and reporting that occurs um, and certainly. You know, one of the reasons the Boston Globe gets stopped billing in this film is because a lot of, uh, a lot of my reporting for the paper uh, um, was, um, uh, you know, used to make this film what it, what it became. Um, I want to ask about the, the drone footage and the underwater photography um, that you did. What was what was what was it like getting those amazing shots of whales? Um, well, um, uh, number one, when we started with the project, uh, we were hoping to uh, go diving with the whales and to shoot them underwater. Uh, but we were told by Noah that that's technically illegal. Um, and um, and it violates the Endangered Species Act. And, um, and to make a long story short, uh, the, the one um, shot that we have underwater with right whales um, was from Canada, where, where it's not illegal. <laughs> and, and that's <laughs> the, this amazing opening shot uh, of the film uh, where, we sh where we are underwater with a whale. Um, so, uh, so that took that off the table, but we, we did get a permit to shoot them from the air. And, um, and, you know, we had a lot of really amazing footage, uh, some of which we acquired from other really wonderful, uh, um, this one wonderful cinematographer and photographer from Canada, Nick Hawkins, uh, um, who was able to fly a drone far closer than we were allowed to here in the States. And he uh, had just incredible footage, including 
uh, another opening shot in the film where he actually got a great shot, uh, drone shot, low drone shot of an entangled whale, um, which was really, you know, um, really amazing to see um, and rare to see. Um, but we were able to shoot them from above uh, and we were also, you know, worked with other people um, who, uh, who have been shooting whales for years and they provided some footage. But it's tricky uh, flying a drone over a whale because they appear and then they're gone and you don't know, you know, always, you know, where they're going to turn up. And so we had, uh, we had some challenges uh, doing that. Um, but, uh, and sometimes the water, depending on the, uh, on the time of day, the water can be dark. And so it might not be super easy to actually, you know, see them. Um, and sometimes, you know, the air can be super uh, blustery on the water and it's hard to control a drone uh, in super high winds. Um, so that, you know, there are all kinds of challenges. Um, but uh, I'm really thankful to the, I don't fly a drone. Uh, my partner, Andy Laub uh, is, has been our drone uh, photographer for most of our films. He didn't actually for this film, uh, but we worked with a bunch of really talented folks. So that was great. Another uh, production question, just because I was editing something today with horrible background noise. Uh, how do you get good sound on a motorboat? <laughs> um, well, it, it's, it's a good question because it can sometimes be really, really uh, challenging. Um, you know, you use the dead cat <laughs> to uh, right. try to black, block the wind. Um, you try to find um, quieter places to, to do interviews, uh, although sometimes uh, that's impossible. And we, um, we certainly had some interviews that were really bad, um, that either were unused or we had to do a lot of post work to try to reduce the, the, the noise of the throttle. Um, but, you know, there, there was just some footage that it was just hard to use. Um, what I tend to do is do my, um, uh, do my interviews off the boat or before the boat or after the boat um, leaves. So I have good footage, I have good sound, um, and then fill that in. Um, it, it, it depends, you know, and sometimes the boat, uh, when the fishermen, you know, are fishing, it's, um, you know, they stop uh, or their the engine's not at full throttle. So it's a little easier to, to, to hear them. But we had actually with Lobster War, uh, one of the funnier questions I, I got um, uh, was um, while I was interviewing a lot of down east fishermen uh, whose accents can be incomprehensible, you know, when there's no, uh, uh, yep. <laughs> when the sound is perfect, um, they, I was asked, <laughs> Well, why didn't I use subtitles, <laughs> um, <laughs> guys? And of course, the uh, the sound, you know, interviewing them on boats. Like so there, there were some interviews that, like, I was so mad because we had we had such great stories that they told, but you just couldn't make, you, you know, between the the accent and the and the boat noise, it it just you know didn't work. Um, I try to, you know, have two or three sources of, of audio when I'm shooting uh, a lav, um, which I try to hide in a place uh, below their shirt, uh, but that can muffle it if it's not quite right. And there's all, all kinds of challenges with lav, lav mics. And if it's out um, and exposed, um, you know, you get a lot of wind noise and then you have your shotgun mic and then you have a boom mic um, if you can, uh, but shooting on fishing boats is sometimes challenging. I, when I usually shoot on a fishing boat, I, I often do it on my own without a sound person because it's, um, uh, it's just, you know, cramped conditions and, um, and, you know, easier to just be one person. Um, but that can make, you know, audio a little challenging. Uh, you know, I rely a lot on the lav.
Yeah. Yeah. I can only imagine being a one man band trying to get that kind of sound and thinking about your picture and everything and your, the content of your interview. That's, that's not an easy thing. Um, so, uh, what was the most, this is another question from Ellen. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, what was the most thrilling part of creating and directing the documentary? What was the most thrilling part? Thrilling. Um, <laughs> I, I would say, uh, completing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, with any, it, it's interesting because, you know, as a, as a writer, um, uh, for, a, for a paper, you know, there's, there's a lot, uh, easier and quicker turnaround for your work to, to be completed. So, um, so I will write a story, uh, or I will report a story and then, you know, within a few hours, the fruit of my labor will be posted on the, on the web, uh, and it'll be there in all its, in all its proverbial glory. Um, um, but with a film, it can be months or years before, you know, all of this work that, you know, you have a vision um, and you don't know if it will really come together uh, because of terrible sound or, you know, and we did have like sound issues here and there and you do your best to repair it in, in, in post when you can or, or bad footage or whatever it is. Um, um, or changing circumstances like a pandemic, you know, ravaging your whole entire plans. Um, so for me, you know, once it starts to come together and you start building scenes, it's just a really cathartic moment because, uh, I, you know, I, I spent uh, months sort of mapping out af while I was shooting and after I shot how I was going to, uh, how the how the film would come together, and we, um, you know, I worked very closely with my partner Andy Laub, who's a terrific editor, um, and you know he just, uh, you know, takes my initial vision and m melds it with his, and usually just makes it better um, than I originally, you know, fathomed how it might 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 be and so it just that creative process uh is a really um is a really wonderful experience and for anyone who hasn't you know uh worked with someone closely like that uh it can be a tense experience when you're working uh with someone you in your and your views or your uh visions don't necessarily mesh together and sometimes you know there's a lot of there's the a significant amount of diplomacy that's involved in trying to sort of, you know, get it to that right place. But when you find a good partner um, and someone you can really work with well, um, my advice is stick with that person um, and uh, and try to make some magic. And that's what we tried. We've tried to do. And we've worked together on uh, five films now. All right, we got another question from Helen. Um, she says, Nick Record, a scientist at Bigelow Labs, wrote an article about right whales in which he said, so many of our environmental challenges from climate change to pollution to deforestation face a similar tension between short-term interests and the sustained health of our environment. All of the efforts to prevent a right whale extinction can teach us lessons useful for many other environmental challenges. What did you sense when interviewing the lobstermen about their attitudes to this problem? Were they concerned about the whales or more concerned about their own livelihood? Uh, well, thank you, Helen, for the question. Uh, Nick Record uh, is actually in the film and uh, he is a, uh, a wonderful dude and, uh, and uh, brilliant scientist and he, um, he and I will be actually in a panel discussion about the film uh, in a few weeks together. Um, but um, uh, Nick's specialty happens to be on the impact of climate change on on the species on on the food source for right whales, uh, this tiny crustacean called Calanus, and his his research uh, has been 
pivotal in our understanding of why um, uh, right whales have been moving further north into Canadian waters where they have uh, died in very significant numbers in, um, in recent years. Um, but the question uh, is what exactly about uh, what... Um, uh, were, were the lobstermen concerned about uh, the whales or more concerned about their own livelihood? Yeah, you know, number one, it, it's, it's hard to generalize. Uh, um, you know, there are people I interviewed who, if you, if you watch the trailer, um, said, fuck the whales. Um, um, and others who were quite uh, enervated uh, by being called on the carpet by environmental groups uh, who they felt were calling them essentially murderers. Um, but there are a lot of other people, including the main lobstermen in the film, uh, who we spend a, a lot of time with, uh, Rob Martin and his wife, Lori Karen, uh, who fish out of Cape Cod Bay here in Massachusetts. Um, and they have uh, experienced some of the greatest hardship from right whale regulations because on Cape Cod Bay, particularly where, where they fish from, they are, um, they are banned from fishing and have been for, I think, four or five years now um, because, of, um, because the uh, protections require much of Cape Cod Bay to be closed when right whales are feeding there in the winter. Uh, and, and into the spring. And this couple, despite that, you know, is, and, and they've coped with all kinds of hardship, um, losing quite a bit of money uh, during that time um, uh, when they can't fish. Um, they, they recognize that there are great dangers for this species. They don't want to see this species go extinct. And they've, you know, done a lot of things to try to uh, protect the species, including using um, rope that uh, breaks at, at uh, a certain pressure uh, that, are, that uh, whales are believed to exert if they get caught in the lines. So it means, you know, changing a lot of their ropes, which is expensive. It means putting these, um, uh, these things called sleeves on the ropes that provide for breaking points. Um, it, it requires special rope that is, uh, uses a, a specific color that makes it allegedly easier for the whales to see, um, and experimenting with all kinds of things like ropeless fishing. Um, and, um, and so, you know, they've done a lot and they are hoping that they are, that they could be, that they uh, will set an example and other fishermen will be able to coexist uh, with the whales um, rather than harming them. And I think, I don't think, you know, any, any fisherman wants to see uh, a right whale injured, um, let alone die. And you hear that repeatedly in the film. Um, and I think that's the truth. But of course, there's a difficult balance when, you know, the chief and the, the thrust of the film is that over the last uh, decade or two, over the last 20 years, essentially, according to uh, the uh, best research, the leading cause of right whale deaths are entanglements in the lines that go from the surface the, uh, to the sea floor, the so-called vertical buoy lines. And those are um, uh, those lines um, are responsible for killing a lot of whales. And, um, and 85 percent of right whales, according to uh, the best research on this issue, have been found to have scarring from entanglement in fishing gear. So it's a problem. It's a serious problem. If we're serious about, you know, if we're serious about trying to save these whales from extinction, we need to deal with that issue. All right. Um, so we're, seems like we're kind of wrapping up here. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Um, but I just wanted to ask, 
do you have anything uh, upcoming that you're working on or uh, has the pandemic kind of thrown everything in flux? Yeah, so at the moment, uh, we're just trying to uh, bring this film into the world, you know, during the worst of possible circumstances. We would normally at this time be doing a theatrical campaign. We are showing the film at uh, film festivals, um, uh, but those are mainly virtual fil film festivals, although I was just invited to an in-person uh, uh, screening of the film, which will be uh, interesting and weird, and I don't know how that's going to go down, but... Um, Where, where's that? And the, the Mystic Film Festival in Connecticut is planning oh, wow. to host an in-person um, uh, film festival. Uh, we'll see if that actually pans out as positivity rates uh, climb, uh, but that's their plan, and uh, uh, I'll be holding my breath. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> if I if I make it there, um, so uh, film into the world and uh, and. Uh, and then we'll go from there. But for the moment, um, we, you know, we, we have our um, hands uh, full, I guess, is, or our plate full. Um, and, you know, I've got a lot of work uh, with the paper and I have two little kids. So just trying to stay sane during this time period is, um, you know, a lot. Cool. Uh, well, Thank you, everybody. Um, oh. Oh, Mike, did you have a question? No, you asked it, but I'm so glad that you did. I just wanted oh, to know okay. what was next as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, great. Um, okay, great. Um, so, David, thank you so much for joining this intimate discussion about Entangled. Um, and what, where can people go to learn more about the film and learn more about the issue? Website yeah. or anything? Yeah, so um, you can put the website into the chat maybe. It's uh, entangled, uh, I guess I could do that. Uh, it's entangledfilm.com, uh, uh, entangled-film.com. And um, uh, you can learn a lot more about the film and see future screenings uh, there. And um, uh, and please feel free to reach out to me if anyone has any questions. Awesome. All right. So I'm just going to plug our next uh, installment of Cinema in Conversation. This is uh, this, this fall series that we're doing. Um, so October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and we're going to um, have people watch the documentary In My Skin um, by Anna Richard. This is a documentary about uh, domestic violence survivors. Um, and then we're going to have a discussion with her after that. So it should be uh, another uh, happy topic. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, thanks everybody for joining and thank you, David. Okay. Save thank the right you guys. whales. Okay. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.